Well, thank you all for coming, and especially thank you for waiting to the Schimmel Forum's roundtable to discuss the medium is the message, which was a radical idea in 1964 that has become a global reality in 2013. I did go back to reading the chapter, uh, which I have for you all, on the, the medium is the message in Marshall McLuhan's book, Understanding Media, The Extension of Man. I was amazed and delighted at Mc, uh, McLuhan's allusions to art and literature, which helped me to understand what he meant when he declared that the medium is the message, and be struck by what a modernist idea it is. For example, he spoke about a Cubist painting as the quintessential example of the medium being the message. I'll read it to you. Cubism, by giving the inside and outside, the top, bottom, back and front, and the rest in two dimensions, drops the illusion of perspective in favor of instant sensory awareness of the whole. Cubism, by seizing on an instant total awareness, suddenly announced the medium is the message. In short, the Cubist painting is not representing or depicting something outside the painting. The painting is the message there before you in its frame or without a frame. Uh, in art, Cubism and the forms of abstraction seem a natu natural prog progression from a painting as an explication or interpretation of something else, something outside the painting, about whether it's a portrait, a landscape, or a still life. On the other hand, with news, especially when you pick and choose your media, the medium as a message can have dire effects, according to McLuhan. He notes this, that C.P. Snow, reviewing a book on appeasement, mused on why top British minds didn't see the dangers of Hitler in the 1930s. He concludes, they would not listen to warnings because they did not wish to hear them. Being anti-red made it impossible for them to read the message of Hitler. They selected the media message that they wanted, apparently precluding consideration of any other message. And then McLuhan, the prescient one, co comments, but their failure was as nothing compared to our one. And today we can say, you know, our, our, ours, is, ours is more, our failure is, uh, is worse and probably has more dire effects than, than his. Uh, the choices are infinite, the impact profound people today can and do indeed choose their medium. Uh, before I turn to Julie to begin the discussion, I want you to join me in welcoming Mark Jerkowitz here at my left. He's a Scranton native, the Associate Director of the Project for Excellence in Journalism at the Butte Research Center in Washington. And we thank you for coming, Mark. My pleasure. But we won't let him say anything until I turn <laughs> this over to Julie uh, to begin the conversation. Well, thank you, Sandra. And we're just going to, I think, do some, mainly some introductions so we can hear some opening comments from Mark. But I'm very excited to be joining in this discussion um, in my role here as director of the Office of Community Relations. And so, of course, there's plenty of uh, Scranton goings on and ways that we are involved as the university in the public affairs issues here in Scranton. My previous work was in Middle East politics, where media plays a huge role, and that, in fact, actually fuels the conflict uh, in many ways. So I think it kind of goes to our point that the medium and the messenger, as the messenger um, and the message, are in inextricably linked. Um, as Sandra has already touched on, I think the, the premise of our discussion is that the medium has changed dramatically in recent years. We may have to ask ourselves whether Facebook posts and Twitter feeds are going to replace reading the crinkly New York Times over a cup of coffee on Saturday morning. I think we all hope it's not going to completely replace that, um, but it certainly has changed. And I think Maureen Dowd, the op-ed that you have here, speaking specifically about the old and new media and how it impacted the Boston bombing recordings, which is you know very relevant and very timely for our discussion. Um, so hopefully we'll, we'll touch on that. Um, but we wanted to really get started by having some introductions around the table, who you are, just briefly, your name, your, if you have an affiliation you want to mention, um, but also maybe how you get your news. Um, and, and if you want to say how you heard first about the Boston bombings or if there's something else you'd like to touch on. I think we said five, <coughs> five to ten words, so not even, not even the 140 characters you're allowed on Twitter, but something uh, more brief than that. So um, maybe we'll start here and then we can end up with Mark so that he can, he can open up our, our comments. I'm Brian Burnham from the Department of Psychology at the University of Scranton. Um, I really get my news through the uh, New York Times, HuffPost, um, Twitter, Facebook, just about any place I can find information. Mm -hmm. 
I'm Kristen Yarmie, I'm the Digital Services <coughs> Librarian here at the University. Um, I do still read the, news, the New York Times in print. I feel odd doing it, but I love it. Um, <laughs> but I also get news from everywhere else at the same time. I'm Vi Kelly, I'm a neighbor of the University, I live in the whole section. Uh, I get my news from the New York Times, from uh, television, whatever, anywhere I can. I'm Jan Kelly, are we related? <laughs> I'm uh, in the Department of Communication, a faculty member. I have taught a little bit about McLuhan over the years, but not all that much to an introductory, in an introductory course. I read the newspaper as well, mm. and I watch the network news, and I watch CNN, and I watch MSNBC. I do not watch Fox. It's <laughs> 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 Joanne Babish. I'm an assistant at the Schimmel Forming Nets, and I mostly take my news online. My name is Kate McDermott. I'm Director of Marketing and Communications at the Scranton Chamber of Commerce. And I will pretty much take my news anywhere I can get it. Newspaper, <laughs> online, television, anywhere. I'm Maury Myers and my affiliation is to the moderator. <laughs> <laughs> she your source of news as well. <laughs> He's my source of news. <laughs> I'm Steve Scheidman, I'm at the Commonwealth Medical College, and I can't believe that I'm the first person who's going to say that I get my news from National Public Radio. Oh, yes. um, yeah. As well as the New York Times. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm Kelly Scheidman, and by default, I get my news from NPR, and uh, <laughs> as well as um, New York Times <coughs> and TV. I'm Gloria Jerkwitz, and I'm Mark's mother, so I get a lot of my news from Mark <laughs> when I have the question. Otherwise, the New York Times and Rachel Maddow. <laughs> I'm Estelle Friedman, and um, all of those, uh, I get my information from all of those places. But I'm actually here because I'm in love with Mark Jerkwitz. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Esther Friedman, no relation to Estelle, but we're frequently uh, confused, apparently. I, I mean, the name's not <laughs> <laughs> that not confused. We're all confused. <laughs> yeah. uh, I do read the New York Times in print and online, and I get Financial Times online, and I listen to NPR, and I watch television, and it, for the Boston event, I really was glued to the uh, television, I have to admit. I was switching stations. But I, I did stick pretty much to the television. I guess I should say where I get my news. So I think most of them have been mentioned. I, I do like to look at my Facebook posts to get a sense of my friends and what they're uh, talking about. And for Middle East politics, which I follow a lot, I go to the local news there. So I look at Haaretz and Israeli and, and Arab uh, you know, uh, media. I'm Richard Yost, and uh, I'm a local. And the Times I read uh, is uh, usually Scranton Times. Uh, I read a lot of magazines or pick and choose. So, uh, usually uh, for an article uh, that I've heard advertised on TV or mentioned on TV, um, I read a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Francis Rogan, a local uh, member of that vast army of retirees. And uh, I don't know, I get my news mostly perhaps in television and recent papers, I make a point to avoid the New York Times. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Will Roth. Uh, I guess, you know, news kind of progresses throughout the day. It started up with the NPR, local mm -hmm. newspaper, then you progress along, you go online. Uh, oftentimes online is a treat. I read the hard copy of uh, the Wall Street Journal. I uh, try to read the hard copy of the New York Times. Um, I like the hard copy and the, the treat, you know, Twitter, you can get a lot of different feeds and then you get the links to, to go over. So that's it's kind of an interesting way of getting a quick smorgasbord depending on your thought. My name is David Falk. Uh, I guess I'm an occasional contributor to the news or the local punditry uh, from time to time. Uh, I get my news from a variety of sources, a whole broad base, and uh, if something I, I deem is important, I generally do a further investigation following links or uh, Googling the, uh, to see where, what the sources were and what the real information was. Uh, the only thing I don't get my news from is Facebook. Uh, don't do that, and uh, that's it. 
I'm John Walsh. I'm retired from that army of retirees. In this case, I was at Public Broadcasting Channel 44 for a number of years. And therefore, true to that, I rely on television, but also commercial television for some of my information. I'm Grace Doggett. I'm a speech pathologist in the area. I get my news from uh, newspapers, television, NPR, <coughs> John Stewart sometimes, <laughs> and um, I find I like to, even though sometimes Fox News can give me a headache, I think it's important to listen to everything, and because I'm a speech pathologist and language means a whole lot to me, I find it interesting to listen to how people say things and what they say and how they take the same event the spin that they generate and put on it and it, you can't is it not true but you know you just it, it's it's I find it fascinating sometimes scary to, to see how things are skewered uh, depending on what the point of view <coughs> of the commentator is and then I you know worry that at some point truth is actually just going to be lost um, I I actually think news should be news and not commentary. Sometimes it's done as news, but yet it's commentary. So anyway, that's where I come. I'm Ann Marie Stanford. I work here at the university. I start my day with NPR. I read the New York Times online. I scan through CNN online, but I have to admit when it's breaking news, I go to the TV. I, I, for mm -hmm. some, I go back and forth, but I, I those are my mainstays. Uh, I'm Robert Salzberg, and I'd like to put in a good word for Facebook. Not one's friends on Facebook, but using Facebook as an index to magazines, newspapers, other periodicals, blogs, and so on. Uh, some people use RSS, I won't go into what that is, but Facebook can work in a similar way. Uh, I read the Times Online, The Guardian, uh, a lot of magazines and journals actually online and paper copies. But I'm more interested these days in not so much breaking news as analysis and commentary. I'm Jane Martin and I get my news through NPR and Mail Air and uh, Friends and, uh, and Enemies. <laughs> so, okay. yeah. Marie Barrett. I come from a family of journalists, so I um, favor the newsprint. But I also get the aforementioned newspapers, and I don't Twitter, Twitter. <laughs> we have Facebook. <laughs> I'm Caddy Clark. I'm a retired teacher, taught at Scranton for 40 years. I mainly get my news from New Sunday New York Times, Morning Joe. <laughs> Show and several TV shows. Dee Dee and uh, I get my uh, news uh, from social media on Facebook. I like the fact with like minds, sometimes they steer me to particular uh, uh, websites that I enjoy reading. Uh, also from radio, TV, when time allows, and uh, BBC. Uh, and also, I like to get international news by reading The Economist every week. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm related to and this lady. You know, we had a tendency to do the same thing. I think I have a number of apps on my iPad that are BBC, CNN, uh, public media, and I go there. If there's if there's breaking news, I of course, like everybody else, hit the television to see what's happening there. And we do like to follow through with the in-depth things. And The Economist is an excellent magazine for that in a lot of regards. Uh, I'm Mark Jerkwitz. I'm the Associate uh, Director of the Pew Research Center's Project for Excellence in Journalism, weirdly named. We're probably going to change it. No one knows what excellence in journalism is, really. <laughs> I'm serious about changing it. Uh, my own news habits, I guess I should start with that very quickly, are I will read the print version of the Washington Post first thing in the morning when I get up. Uh, when I drive to work, I will listen to ESPN Radio until I get sick of Golick and Greenberg. Then I will turn to NPR uh, for morning edition. When I'm at work, I get my news from a variety of, of sites, from CNN to the Huffington Post to my favorite blogger, Andrew Sullivan. 
uh, maybe five or other or six other places during the course of the day. If there's a breaking event, I tend to turn to CNN during the course of the day. Um, and then when I get home at night, I absolutely Im imbibe in no news whatsoever because at that point, watching news would be like a postman taking a walk on his day off. <laughs> um, let me, I just wanted to talk for a couple of minutes about uh, the structure of, of the media environment that we now live in. Um, wh what we do at the Project for Excellence in Journalism is really sort of three things. One is a content analysis, i.e. a scientific evaluation of the work that's being produced by the news media largely in the United States. Uh, another area of work we do is we do a lot of, uh, of public opinion surveys or surveys asking people how they are consuming news on the variety of digital platforms that are now available and what these various platforms mean for the kinds of news that are going to be successful. And last but certainly not least is in the last couple of years we've begun to use empirical methods to really look closely at the economics of the news industry. Um, because at the end of the day the industry is what it produces and what it produces is a function of how much money there is to some degree, how much money there is to produce it. So Sandra kind of asked me uh, to talk a little bit about the greatest challenge is for the news industry, and I would, at this point, I would boil it down to one overarching challenge, and that is the question of what, going forward, will subsidize, pay for quality journalism, expensive journalism, because quality journalism, to a great extent, is expensive. It costs money. It costs money to uh, open bureaus or staff bureaus around the world. It costs money to have investigative units in which five or six reporters are being paid full time to maybe produce a story every six months or a year. It costs money to develop expertise in areas like health and the environment and science um, in order to report it uh, in, a, in a substantial and significant way. Um, what this is, is a, both a challenging, exciting, and extremely frightening time. And a lot of that has to do with the basic business model of journalism and how it's changing. Uh, now, I say this in knowing that I am in a market where newspaper penetration is still robust. Um, and frankly, I'm next to a city that might be one of the last five or six cities in America that has a two newspaper town, um, two daily newspapers functioning. So this is a little bit of an outlier community. But essentially, the legacy model it, the legacy media model, the old media um, business model is in big trouble and, and you would not see that any more clearly than in the newspaper sector. Since 2006, America's newspapers have lost half of their advertising revenue. There have been massive cutbacks in staff and here's a number that will kind of chill you a little bit. For every one dollar gain that a newspaper now gains in digital advertising revenue. Uh, advertising revenue associated with its website or its mobile platforms or whatever, it loses $16 in print advertising. So you don't have to be a mathematician to see what the business trajectory is there. The, digi the problem that we have with the digital model in journalism and at, at where my shop, we now predict the local television news is about to enter the same kind of choppy economic waters that newspapers have been in for the last decade, is that everybody anticipated the movement of eyeballs online. Everybody knew and thought that more and more people were going to get, over time, more and more news online. That was anticipated, and frankly, a lot of people were excited about it. You think about the mere production costs of publishing a print newspaper, which are extremely expensive presses, and the fact that you then got 25 or 30 or 50 trucks in a parking lot that get, have to be filled with fuel every single day to deliver newspapers to places. Um, so if you had gone to these kinds of owners a long time ago and said, hey, we're going to move to a, leg, uh, a digital business model, they'd be thrilled. They would have been able to cut all these production costs. The single biggest business problem in journalism so far is the failure of the digital business model to appear. And the biggest single reason why there hasn't been a robust 
digital online business model is the failure of digital advertising to work in the same way as it worked for your newspaper. And I tell, ask people this all the time. If you're reading a daily newspaper and you see an advertisement, you may look at it, you may appreciate it, you may turn the page, but it's sort of part of the experience. If you're, in the, if you're online and you're moving around online and an advertisement pops up, your first instinct is to hunt for the X um, or something like that. So the fundamental problem for the business model in journalism has been the failure to monetize all those eyeballs that are going online. I worked for the Boston Globe in the 1990s and 2000s for 10 years. When I was there, the daily circulation of the paper was 500,000. Today it's about 250,000. But if you add in the eyeballs to their online offerings, a bigger than ever audience has access to Boston Globe content. I would be read by more people today than I would when I was there with the circulation of 500,000. The problem is that no one has figured out yet how to make money from all those digital eyeballs. Digital advertising last year grew at 3%. That's anemic. It's not nearly enough to make up for the print losses. So what you're starting to see is something that I believe you have in this city already, which is paywalls. You guys, how many free visits do you get to the, the Times Tribune before? Ten per month. How many? Ten? Ten. Okay. So what newspapers have finally decided, because they are not generating the amount of digital advertising they wanted, is that they've got to make news consumers pay. They've got to make news consumers pay for digital offerings. For a long time, there was almost this philosophical or theological debate about whether to charge money for online journalism. Some people said, online, online is free. It's all about freedom. We don't want to create hierarchies. We don't want to create information haves and have-nots. The ethos is free, so don't charge. And other people said, you know, we pay for these journalists to produce this kind of journalism, and that costs money, and these people, have, and the public has to understand there's value, and the way they understand there's, there's value is by making them pay for this product. That debate has essentially ended, not because one side won or lost, but because everybody looked at what was happening with digital advertising and said, we need another revenue stream. So there are now about 450 American newspapers which is about a third of all the dailies in the country, that are now charging for online content. And in much the way that you guys talked about, it's kind of what we call a metered system, which means you get X number of free visits, X number of free page views, and then at that point, you're going to have to pay. Um, the theory is if you go 10 times a month, you're kind of a loyal reader. You like us. We're part of your experience. You'll pay for us. The other interesting thing is, in most of these offers, is if you have a print subscription, you get, it for, you get the digital for free. Um, so frankly, for the future of newspaper journalism at least, the, however this paywall experiment turns out, and it's too early to know, um, will say a lot about the future of the industry. Right now, the New York Times, it used to be that it, the model for newspapers was 80% of the revenue came from advertising, 20% of the revenue came from subscribers. At the New York Times right now, they make more money from circulation, both print and digital, than they do from advertising. That's a huge change. Um, let me just say a couple other things quickly and then I'll let you guys get back to the discussion. In this sort of changing media landscape where we're seeing the big newsrooms, breaking down and getting smaller over time, we see a lot of interesting new players arising. One of them, frankly, and, and we're working on a study on this right now, is what we call nonprofit news organizations. All over the country, we've identified close to 200 of them that are small, online-only news operations. 75% of them have five or fewer staffers. They run on budgets of 500,000, 250,000. But because they are nonprofits, they are able to accept foundation donations and foundation giving and giving and public and donations and funding that is tax exempt. <laughs> what they have done is they are not trying to replicate the, everything that a newspaper does from <coughs> sports to weather to national news. They're picking niches, uh, journalistic gaps that they think are now being left open by what's happened to the broader journalism world and focusing on either their local city hall or the state house 
or the environment, and maybe the most famous one is ProPublica. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's based out of New York. It was started with a $10 million donation from a wealthy San Francisco Democrat named Herb Sandler. Um, and it, it does only one thing, investigative journalism. And their whole theory was that in a time of tightening resources, that expensive investigative journalism was going to be the first thing to go in most newsrooms. So they are literally trying to fill that kind of niche. The other kind of exciting new player, obviously, is the citizen journalist. We, we now have the means and the technology to make everyone in the world a reporter. We saw that, ha we've seen it happen a million times. We, we've seen it, we saw it happen, obviously, during the, the, the Arab Spring. We saw it happen during the 2005 subway attacks in London. We saw it happen in Boston. We know that the first person to break the news of the attack on bin Laden's compound in Pakistan was a local neighborhood blogger who heard a helicopter overhead. Um, so the citizen journalist, and I won't go into any great detail, is now increasingly, although I'll be with different standards, becoming a part of the information ecosystem that never existed before. Um, and I want to just say one thing about uh, social media which is also becoming an increasingly big part of the media ecosystem. Um, we have one of our organizations at Pew does what we call news consumption surveys. Every two years they ask people how they get news. And really the question they pose is, did you get your news this way yesterday? So the last one they did, which was in 2012, they asked, did you read a newspaper yesterday? Print newspaper. Only 23% of American adults said yes. In 2000, that number was about 50%. Then they asked whether or not you got news from some kind of social networking or social site the day before. That number was 19%, almost as high as the number that read newspapers. And the trajectories are very different, because when they asked that question in 2010, only 9% of people said yes. So that's double in a mere two years. Um, Interestingly, we think there's some evidence that getting news from, fam from fam family and friends, however you get it, actually enhances news consumption. Um, most people who get news from family and friends say they still do it the old-fashioned way, like talking uh, or phone calls or in person. 15% uh, say they usually get it from some kind of social media site from family and friends. The good news there is, however, that however they get it, people who get news from family and friends are very likely to then go and seek out the original journalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one thing we have to keep in mind when we talk about, at the end of the day, there has to be a, an initial content producer, a source of journalism somewhere, no matter how, much of it, how we access it, that we trust, that we think is credible, and that is fundamentally telling us as close a version to the truth as they can get. And that's at the core of all of the rest of the sort of media landscape and universe. So it's an interesting time. It's an exciting time. It's a scary time for people who are interested in the news business. The one thing that we said in the overview of our State of the News Media Report, which is our signature product, it's 160,000 words. No, we don't actually print it out in any kind of a... Um, is that we are concerned, with, even with all these new entrants into the field, that there are starting to be some very, very tangible impacts from the reduced reporting resources in the news industry. Um, and one of them was we asked a simple survey question of people. We said, have you abandoned a news outlet you once used because it no longer gives you the kind of information that you've become accustomed to getting? 31% of the respondents said yes. And that may sound like a big number or a small number, but I would suggest that if there were any other business in which a third of the customer base essentially was dissatisfied with the product, it would be crisis time, which I think to some people is where we are. Well. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, I suppose, would like to know, uh, we, we've talked about where you are getting your news from, 
uh, how how scared are you, and what what are we? Um, what is this divide between speed and and facility and getting something accurate? It, it seems that we need more accuracy than ever, and we're probably getting less of it. So why can't we afford accuracy? <laughs> Are you asking me, or do we want to? Oh, open ask anyone. Well, let me just say yeah. let me say one thing that really illustrates that well, and then I'll then I'll shut up. Um, you know, the a lot of the information that obviously flowed in after the Boston Marathon bombings, you know, came including video and and, and pictures came from citizen journalists, right? It's a good thing. It's it's called crowdsourcing <coughs> when you're essentially using the entire you know, citizenry to help generate information. Uh, and that helps a lot. It's really a kind of a good thing. However, there was then one site uh, called Reddit. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of it. Okay. And Reddit decided that it wanted to use crowdsourcing as a way of solving the case. Now this was obviously in the hours before we knew he did it. And, and sort of invited people's input about who they thought might have essentially done this, or what kind of clues they had. And within a very brief period of time, a young man, a Brown University student who had no connection to the crime, was identified as a potential suspect here. Okay? So there is the classic clash yeah. between something that's good, which is crowdsourcing, getting information, and the fact that there's no sort of behind the scenes editing so that suddenly someone who's not associated with this at all is being associated publicly with a heinous crime. By the way, just in a weird uh, post-mortem, postscript to that, the young man who was identified uh, by Reddit was found dead, um, but had been actually been missing. Had, he had died before any of this actually happened. It, it just what turns out to be bizarre you know, mm -hmm. circumstances. But there's a classic clash between getting information, getting it from multiple sources, and the potential negative impacts of doing so in a less structured environment. Well, if I can add to that, because I had just read on the New York Times a story about Reddit, and they quote, but this is what you were just talking about, but the, the Reddit, I guess, you know, uh, man, general manager says, its, its purpose is a sort of attention aggregator. It can tell you what to pay attention to, but it is certainly not a replacement for news reporting. So they're really trying to distance themselves from being seen as being, you know, responsible in a sense for accurate news. They want to play that role of, as you said, crowdsourcing. And they did apologize, by the way, formally. Mark, Mark uh, I don't want to take this off in too, too far a different direction, but uh, you know, that last example sort of goes against the book, The Wisdom of Crowds, uh, you know, if, if you read that. However, um, we're not, we're now talking about, in that instance, the creation of news. They're, they're creating a story. They're not reporting a story. They're creating a story. And uh, one thing that I think was implicit in what some of, some of the people say, particularly with regard maybe to Fox News, is the creation of disinformation uh, that, 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 go, that, that goes on as well for whatever, for political purposes or, or what have you. And I don't want to, and again, if that's not where you want to go, no, I don't no, I want yeah, to, I, I mean, I, and we, we, see, we are seeing more of that. Part of what I do and what, what I research yeah. is I'm seeing more and more of this, um, unfortunately, in even academia. You see it in medical research where you've had journals had to retract uh, stories because the drug companies had really written the story and just had a doctor sign off on that. Uh, you, you know, phony science, uh, the, you know, the, the stuff that uh, about global, global, well, climate change, I'll use that phrase, even the, the terms that you use are that, um, where you know you have think tanks whose purpose is only to create stories that are favorable to, to certain people, and then they move it over to the people who can they create blast it out. For, yeah, yeah sort of talking out the great noise machine that, that, that's been talked about, and so all of this is in the mix. I mean, when you're talking about the Scranton Times or you're not even in the same ballpark as these other issues that are that are out there and, and, and floating around and get a lot of get a lot of traffic. I mean, the, every year we have a war on Christmas. You know, to, you know we're, we're, we're only Bill you know, because, Riley thinks that's Yeah, but people talk about it. Okay. People talk about those things. 
rather than the war in Iraq, the war in, you know, mm -hmm. are we going to have a war in Syria? They, they take it that seriously, and you've got a self-created defense to that, which is you cannot tr trust the mainstream me media. You have an entire group that has grown up for 20 or 30 years listening to Rush Limbaugh, who has been, and Gwen Beck, who have told you, you can't trust any other sources except us because they're, they're bad. So I, I don't know where that plays in anything you're saying or, or not. Well, it, it, I mean, I think it's a huge issue. You know, um, uh, I think this is, the, in some ways, is the best time and the most challenging time to be a news consumer. Uh, I mean, could you imagine anybody fulfilling the role, or at least the way I remember it, uh, in, in today's media universe that Walter Cronkite did? No. Uh, that, you know, or Eric Severi, yeah, Eric Severi, Eric Severi? where, yeah. you know, <laughs> Uncle Walter said and that's the way it is, and mm -hmm. a huge percentage of America believed him. Could we imagine what would happen today if his Tet Offensive commentary had been given? What he would have been, half the country would have attacked him, half the media outlets in the world would have attacked him, the other, instead, the Pentagon blames him, you know, for ending the war, right? <laughs> um, there are obviously, what we've lost is, and, for, and there's a lot of good in this, we've lost the gatekeeper media, okay? There was a time when, in a much smaller uh, and contracted media universe, uh, there were a bunch of powerful media organizations that essentially delivered the news to Americans, and they tried to deliver it as real news, um, without spin, without politics involved. Now, there were big downsides to that. Um, I think we would, uh, and you may feel completely differently about this, but I think we could say that John F. Kennedy probably made Bill Clinton look like a monk, but none of us ever found out about it while he was president <laughs> because the media was very different in those days and the gatekeepers didn't want that story to get out. Right now, we live in a world really where I think we're talking almost about niche journalism, you know, and, me, and matching yourself to an audience. So we talk about cable news, which is incredibly powerful. It's, it's the most obviously, I mean, there are websites that are ideological. It's the most obvious, if you watch MSNBC, and, and Fox every night, not only are you going to get different opinions, you're going to get different facts. You don't know if the sun's rising in the east or the west if you're watching those. And frankly, they, they don't really care. What they, what, you know, Fox News, and, and, and they have a sort of an outsized reputation and influence. As, bad, as much as everybody talks about the shriveling of the audience for the CBS Evening News and the NB, you know, the NBC Nightly News and all that, those programs, even though the smallest of those programs, which is CBS, gets tw twice or three times the audience O'Reilly gets on a given night. Mm -hmm. But O'Reilly, and, and that's the most popular cable show, news show mm -hmm. in America. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's a sort of a, uh, so Fox and MSNBC aren't going for all of America. They're going for three million hardcore people on one side of the issue or three million hardcore people on the other side of the issue. Christian. I think something that needs to be brought up in that context is the shift from mass marketing to targeted behavioral advertising. So it's not really advantageous to advertisers to look for the three million eyeballs when only 300,000 of those eyeballs might be interested in your products. When we look at the amount of personal data collection and tracking that's going on, there's this huge incentive to identify exactly who you want to see your content as opposed to getting as many people as you can think of to see your content. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, the, the financial incentives are driving the shape mm -hmm. of the news. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that most people don't really know about. Mm -hmm. And it gets me really angry. <laughs> <laughs> well, as, as educators, as there are several in the room. What, how can you uh, have your students, can you make them more discerning about not only what they favor, but what is what is more accurate than something else? Yeah? Well, yeah, I mean, just for background, I study human attention, um, and the attention aggregator, no pun intended, caught my attention. Um, <laughs> but one of the big uh, challenges we face as ed educators is just that, is how do we kind of uh, have students focus on um, the important information and disregard irrelevant information, or I should say, um, misleading information. And as, a, uh, as an attention researcher, um, one of the um, things that's fundamental to human cognition is the ability to reflect on and contemplate information 
but what we really fear in my field is with the 24, and this kind of came up a minute ago, what we really fear is cell phones going off at random. <laughs> <laughs> um, you should have them checked at the door like okay. they do in high um, school. What we really fear is with the 24-hour uh, news cycle is we're losing the ability to uh, engage in contemplative thought. Um, mm -hmm. We don't have time to just reflect on the information that we're taking in. We're just taking in too much. Um, our information our information processing system is pretty uh, extensive, but we can only handle so much. And uh, I can say in my lab, we're already seeing changes in human attention in the last 10 to 12 years, which is a basic process. Yes. Well, I think yes. there's yeah. a, I think there is a, uh, an underlying problem that occurs with the, with the media, as the diversity of the media as I see it, and that is that people who have specific types of opinions or political leanings and also have <coughs> money are able to create organizations that make the news sound like they want it to sound. Like, I mean, who, who do you, uh, do you have anything specifically of that? It's like selling, selling news. Yeah, they're selling news, you know. Selling news be, with some uh, political agenda. Right, yeah. with a political agenda. That's Social something. Agenda. I mean, 100 years ago in New York, you, you know, right. you, you exactly. had Hearst and, and a right. Pulitzer right. papers, and yeah. you knew by what paper yeah. right. someone had under their arm what what it was when mm -hmm. you had that vast array of, of papers, whether you're reading The Sun, The Telegraph, The, 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 the Herald Tribune, or whatever. Although, right, although that, that went away, and yeah, the American long. journalism, sort of like post-World War II, became different. Something very basic. Uh, I was in college when I heard the medium is the message, and that, that didn't mean much Not to me. Five years later, I joined a faith community, a church. And I'm sure it's the same way in the synagogue and, and, and the mosque as it is in the church. We're confronted with this at every gathering. The, the preacher gets up in front of you, and at the point where there's a hard word to be delivered, he or she can fudge it, uh, uh, trying to make it more palatable. And so uh, one can give in to the temptation of entertaining. Uh, it, it has to go along with the idea of uh, somehow the cult of personality uh, that, that can win the day. And after a while, if that's successful, the preacher uh, whoever he or she is becomes very popular and very powerful, but is not giving the message correctly. Uh, somehow has become a figure, authority figure, but at the same time, the message isn't authentic. And I, I think that's what I've heard since the first person spoke here tonight. We're getting the kind of uh, information that sells well. So, so for, for those of you who, who want to start at the beginning, uh, I, I can't understand some of the, the, the technology and all of that, but I think um, it, it, uh, uh, William Randolph Hearst was just mentioned. And, and he wanted to sell something, and he, he, he made it very sellable. The question was, is, is it true? So, so you know, this has been uh, probably everyone here at, right, at one time or another has had some kind of experience within a, a gathering of the faith, and, and, and that's what you get sometimes, uh, aversion. Yeah, the thing is, how do we help people discern what, you know, what is more reliable? And is, was there ever a time, or am I really naive, was there ever a time when journalism was unbiased and balanced and where opinion wasn't interjected? It feels like everything's an opinion page now. And it feels like people self-select for the opinion they want to hear. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. I grew up thinking that journalism was a very 
uh, a, a, a great field to be in because they were looking for truth, you know, justice in the American way. Right? <laughs> well, that was Superman. And, right, right. <laughs> but, you know, it just feels like nobody really cares if they're biased or not anymore, that they just put their opinions out, they weave it in, you know, to the story. Well, I was, I was just in response to that. The, um, the famous headline, wrong headline, Dewey defeats mm -hmm. Truman, was 1948. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So even though we have, you know, just the Syria hackers, you know, telling us that the White House was exploding and Obama was injured, that was a wrong reporting due to Twitter and social media. But that was 60 years ago. Right. And that was because they didn't like Truman. Truman. And, you know, and he then touted it as he went around. Right. This was, you know, mm -hmm. proof that he did win. So in some ways, things change, but they don't always change as much as we might think. I think that there were times when you had felt you had more reliable sources to uh, check in on whether or whatever, even if you were very ideologically one way or the other. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm just saying, I, I would agree with that. I mean, I, I, a lot of the ideology just comes from the expansion of the media universe. Mm -hmm. And I think that a lot of journalism uh, in the days when we think it was, you know, when the op-ed pages were clear and the rest of it was really straight news, wasn't great journalism. By any means, but you sort of felt like they were giving it to you straight. Mm -hmm. you know? Well, yes and no. I think what's what we're identifying is that an individual, whether it be a person of huge wealth and use it in his newspaper empire or radio. I mean, those of you who may recall Father Coughlin in the 30s had the largest radio audience in the history of radio transmission. And his theme was very simple, anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we talk about preachers now, or we talk about people skilled in gaining access to the media for uh, malevolent purposes, we have the same condition of individuals with some kind of extraordinary characteristic that they can influence the many. What we're seeing is just a continuation of the few controlling the many. So I want to ask you, Mark, having uh, heard all of this doomsday, what's good? <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot that's good. Uh, I mean, the truth is, the amount of good information that's floating out yes. there is bigger than ever before. Um, now, it takes time and energy to find it sometimes, and the amount of crap is, uh, is bigger than ever before. So what, what the, the hard thing is the sifting. There, there's absolutely no doubt about that. And if, if I had a hundred million dollars and, and cared about the media industry in this country, I would, you know, this wouldn't really get far, a hundred million, but I think teaching media literacy starting in elementary in grade school yeah. would probably be the single most important mm -hmm. thing you could do on a civic, mm -hmm. at, you know, scale of this country to basically support quality journalism and to bolster the democracy. So. We put out this report uh, more in, that, in which we said we're concerned that uh, you know, a lot of reporting resources have been lost and we think there are real impacts here. And, and uh, frankly, a lot of it, and again, it may not be this community, a lot of it's been lost at the very local level, coverage of things like local. For the average American who, doesn't, who can't sit in front of his computer all day and surf and find blogs and stuff like that, the things like local, you know, local journalism, your state house, your city hall, in a way that matters to you, those kinds of things, you know, have largely gone missing, um, and uh, that's, you know, I think that's one of the bad things we've seen. We said so. We came out with a negative report, and a very notable blogger by the name of Matt Iglesias took issue with us and basically said, "You're wrong. These are the best of times," and he then talked about the. What was happening at that moment was the banking crisis in Cyprus, something that's far too esoteric a topic for everybody but about 2% of anybody. Um, and he said, if you wanted to find out about the banking crisis in Cyprus, I, you know, all you had to do is, you know, if you go online, you'll find an unbelievable, four, you know, an <coughs> unbelievably, you know, relevant four-year-old story in the Atlantic, and you'll find this guy blogging, and you, and you can find this guy tweeting from Cyprus. And so, that's the good, which is if you have the time and the intellect and the ability to sift good from bad, there the store, the shelves of the store are more stacked than they've ever been before. Unfortunately, there's a lot of grade B product out there too. You know, you 
raised the question about the decline of revenues and affecting the serious impact on newsprint in this country. For example, Harrisburg is now three days a week. Yep. Here's Christmas. Yeah. Newspaper in the state capital, and as you know, you have New, New Orleans. Orleans. New Orleans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But here we are in a higher educational institution, yeah. and its problems are the same because online is uncertain as how it's going to affect second, uh, the non the non elite institutions in this country. So the New York Times will survive, and Harvard will survive, but they're facing a similar situation. Yes. Uh, a fellow from the Washington Post uh, spoke with the journalist students here a number of years ago, and he went on to become the NPR digital director in terms of where things are going. And he was addressing the, the journalist students, and he was kind of saying, hey, good luck. You know, like, uh, start a blog. Um, you're not going to get a job. You're not going to get paid much. Um, your salary is going to be a fraction of what the earlier generation got. Uh, so the concern I have is paywalls, what's the information overload doing to our mind, so to speak? Um, I think Marshall McCoon taps, talks about <clears throat> we are what we behold in terms of the input and the information that we take in. And uh, we shape our tools and the tools shape us. And you're kind of saying that the, the tools are changing, the, the quality is variable, and where do you think we go from here? <laughs> uh, and let me just say one quick thing about what the Washington Post guy said. It, 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 for people, young people who are in uh, journalism school are still stunningly optimistic about the profession, which is good mm -hmm. to know, and I think that's partly, you know, um, the grace of youth. Um, um, but uh, the, the things have changed dramatically from when I started in journalism. There was a clear career path. If you did this well, you went here. If you did that well, you went here. If you did that well, well, you probably had a job for life that you were comfortable with. Now that ladder has been all the all the spokes or whatever you call it are broken. Okay, that there is no ladder like that to climb. So frankly, there are a lot of people in journalism schools basically telling you know kids. The, for young people, the way you're going to be successful now in the journalism world is become your own brand. Now, and, that, and part of that is because you, you know you no longer need to be attached to the means of production. You are, you have the means of production. You don't need to work for a newspaper because they can produce your work. You can do it on your own now with a computer. So that is part of the message that you are hearing. Where we go from here is, if I could honestly tell you that, I, I would. Um, I think a big question is whether or not in the next five to ten years the, the, the crisis in, in traditional journalism um, and traditional newsrooms driven by both the economic and technological disruption of the digital age can be resolved with a, with a kind of business model that supports enough journalism. If, it's, if not, then all bets are off. You know, I mean, there will be journalism for sure and a lot of it will be good. But I couldn't tell you how you're going to get it. We have a two-tiered system then? Like those that have money will be able to access the journals and the, the good databases, and well, those that don't won't? But isn't some of the problem true, yeah. the fact that the New York Times eventually could not have the could not afford to have foreign correspondents on the ground, and then you're going to you're going to lose that local mm -hmm. reporting that you mm -hmm. you need. So that even if you even if you had a tiered system, that you can't you won't have the news to actually access. I mean, isn't that part of? The, yeah. Uh, you know? Look, I mean, the first thing that happened at Boston Globe when the money got tight was they sure. closed every foreign bureau. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right mm -hmm. off the bat. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know. So, and you know, the irony is that the, just when um, we are more global and more interdependent than ever, we will be getting less information about others. So, I mean, I feel sorry for the people in journalism, but I really feel sorry for or, a, a democratic society. And the, the, or we may be getting all our information from people on the ground yeah, right. tweeting. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We won't yeah. be getting less yeah. information yeah. altogether. We'll be getting a ton more information. Yeah. 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 So I, I'd like to pose a question that, that might get at your um, dilemma as to whether things, things are this is the best of times or the worst of times. Uh, over a decade ago, the United States was led into a war, some people would say partly because of the abdication of 
traditional journalism, voice of God journalism, that, you know, this is the way it is, um, to ask questions when the government made certain claims. Now, and that was before the downsizing of so many media outlets, particularly print media and the foreign bureaus and all that. So today, if a government tried to get away with lying to the people into, into a war, would the mass of information on the crowd be a better check than the media were a decade ago? Well, <laughs> that's, I mean, if there, were, if there were people on the ground in Iraq saying, believe me, Saddam doesn't have weapons of mass destruction, it might have helped 10 years ago. Um, that's a very good question. Inspectors were there telling us that. Well, they, yeah, but they can't, it's very hard to prove a negative. Uh, and that was, but, but I think there are two things happened there. One, I think that, that it, it showed, no matter how independent, people did question the, the run-up to the war. Walter Pincus at the Post was one of them. And they were on A14, while you know, the people listening to Curveball and the bogus sources cooked up by the administration were on A1. It does show the disproportionate power that the government had. I think if the, let's take Iran. And I, let's just, it's the editors who choose which page it's going to be on. Correct. Paul, Paul Krugman here yeah. makes that point about the post. They absolutely do. Because fundamentally, there is a kind of a, you know, a, a, there is a rallying around the flag, I think, when the government starts to make a case for war. There's a real momentum there. Um, uh, I think um, news organizations start basically talking to each other. I will tell you, I, I was reporting on you know, news organizations in the run-up to the war in Iraq. You know what they were actually doing? They were getting, they, they were so sure that the war was inevitable that they were actually, an incredible amount of their intellectual ed energy was focused on the logistics of getting ready to cover a war. Mm -hmm. A war in which they thought there would be chemical weapons. They were armed so you could weapons. feel the newsroom, rather than looking at the, the real question, is yeah. have they made a sufficient yeah. case for yeah. war, saying, we got to get our men trained, we got to get our men. And, and so the energy went in, a, because they saw it as inevitable. The energy went in a very mm -hmm. strange direction. Mm -hmm. yeah, the, to your question of could people on the ground, yeah, it could. I think that could have an impact. They were embedded, right? Well, then they were embedded <laughs> once the war started, yeah. Which was the Pentagon's I idea, by the way, not journalists' so. idea. Yeah. Yeah. Well, didn't the same thing just happen in the last two weeks with the differential that existed between what the uh, atrocities in Boston and the ones in Texas? Uh, Boston got. How many hundred thousand times more play? Three people died. I mean, a lot of people were injured, granted. But look at the difference in play that that got compared to the, the explosion in Texas, where, what, 150 people died? Mm -hmm. No, I don't no, think. No, no. 50 died, but 200, 200, 200. Right, it was a more lethal event. Yeah. yeah. But it was the terror aspect. Yeah, yeah. 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 different. Yeah. Also, that it happened in Boston. And, you know, yeah. uh, you know, where you had a, a large media presence at a, at a particular time. I mean, look, we can't underplay the ability of certain people to, getting back to a previous point, to amplify attention and amplify their message. Uh, you know, the hometown newspaper in West Texas, if there is one, just can't compete with all the cameras in the world that were on Boston in, a, in an international event. It just, it just doesn't matter. And, and newsrooms, too, whether it's commercially driven or not, uh, make decisions about how much coverage should yeah. be given. Yeah. I want to throw out a slightly different point because, you know, we've talked about having all these reporters and, and things like that, but there is a growing trend to suppress the news. For instance, uh, you've probably all seen undercover videos that are shot. I mean, you see them on ABC, you've seen them on 60 Minutes, you see the PETA things, for, for instance. And I don't know how many of you know that there are actually laws in place, probably from ALEC or something, that prohibit people from doing this in certain industries and certain plants. And, there are propo and they are proposing more laws, so you can't go into a chicken factory or you can't go into a hog factory and take an undercover video of people abusing the animals or showing unsafe conditions. The, or you can't be Upton Sinclair anymore mm -hmm. because you have committed a felony because the industries have gotten things, uh, gotten the legislature to pass laws which prevent you from 
from doing this stuff. Uh, I mean, that's a trend. The other thing, you, you mentioned education. Um, there is a huge trend now for homeschooling where people don't want their kids to learn anything but what we know and what we want you to know. Uh, I think the epitome of that might have been uh, Rick Santorum in the last election who said, you know, Barack Obama wants everybody to have an education. What a snob. You know, he wants his kids to only learn what he wants them to learn. It's not, not broad-based. It's whatever you want to call it. And that, that's out there uh, as well. It's, it, they, they're worrisome trends, in my opinion. Uh, but they're they're there, and um, you know, so maybe we have a lot more to look forward to. But maybe we, we don't. I, I just uh, I, I I just spoke down in Washington. I mentioned something about Regents University and some of the law schools that they're affiliated <coughs> with, some of these uh, Liberty and whatever. And someone said that they've gone to one of them. I can't remember which one. And, they, they had a problem getting a contracts book because they didn't have the right perspective, the religious perspective of contracts being taught in a law school that was going to put people out there to, to practice. And I mean, these things are, are they're, they're not expanding information, they're contracting information. Oh, there's someone behind you and then Bob. And well, I, I wanted. Oh, yeah. oh. Well, just the gentleman who's behind oh. David. Do you see any danger of the demise of the printed word and the possibility that the national public radio will become perhaps the principal organ in the country? I think we can all, I, you know, I, just speaking for myself, I, I, although Sondra and I were talking about the, <laughs> what texting is doing to the English language, um, uh, no, I, I, don't, I don't see that happening. And, uh, I think the printed word is going to be around for quite some time. I, you know, I mean, online journalism. Do you think it's appropriate to the national public radio? Is it appropriate as an out as an outlet? Well, not as an outlet. Where do they get their information from? What do they say? And who directs the, na the national public radio? People have been extremely critical, of, like of Fox News, and not the other networks. And I don't know that Fox News has ever been charged with editing tapes. Yeah. Nothing. Uh, no, I mean, my personal opinion is that NPR, has, while they've had their share of, of mistakes, uh, is generally a quality journalistic outlet. That would be my... With the exception that they edit tapes occasionally. No, not with the exception that they edit tapes occasionally. I would say that, by and large, I mean, this is my own, my own personal opinion. You can disagree. But I think they, they have excellent reporters and, by and large, do excellent journalism. That doesn't mean that certain people don't think there's bias there. They, they seem to be to ignore some stories, to be conspicuously absent from reporting them, like the trial in Philadelphia of the abortion doctor, until they were shamed by other media. Were they not? Well, I, I, we could get into that particular case, but I, I, no, I don't think they were shamed by other media. I, I it's just mean, obviously a longer time to get into the I, I mean, race, so to speak. Yeah, and it took it, so it took other organizations a longer time, and and frankly, you could look. Many outlets are identified by their news agenda, so we when we look at content, we can tell you the stories that Fox News doesn't cover, and we can tell you the stories that MSNBC doesn't cover, and you would easily be able to make the connections as to why. Well, so I mean, I, I understand that. where you're coming from. Well, but, I, I, yeah. Yes, we should be told that. Mm -hmm. yeah, um, uh, um, I, 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 eventually, I'd like to get back to the, the question. I mean, I, I personally would like to say something eventually about whether there was ever an objective time in news reporting. And as far as I'm concerned, no. But I want to ask you a concrete question about something very concrete. Why has no newspaper or no news source adopted a system of micropayments for specific articles instead of these general paywalls that block off news from a whole city online. You know, I'm not going to pay for a year's subscription to the Dallas, whatever it is, in Dallas, Texas, in order to read a few articles a year. You know, and the same with the Globe. I don't think the Globe does give you ten free articles. I, I haven't been no, able to get Boston, the Globe. The Boston Globe website is bizarre. They basically have a free site and a hard paid site. Mm -hmm. 
Um, the free, free site has a bunch of general stuff, and some of their journals, and the hard paid site has, yeah. They, to, the, to their credit, they did drop the paywall uh, during the week after the bombing. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, there's some flexibility there. Yeah. But, I mean, wouldn't it make more sense to adopt a system of, you know, a few cents or fractions of a cents for viewing an article? People, I don't know. This was a big thing 10 years ago, and nobody's ever done it. I know, absolutely. And there was a lot of talk about it. And I don't know whether the technology wasn't any good, whether people crunched the numbers and said it wouldn't work. I honestly don't know why they haven't tried that. Yeah. And for, uh, uh, there has been, some, I mean, even the paywalls obviously have, have a trick morphed over time. And, and, and there are great differences. I mean, the Times set up a notoriously leaky paywall. You can get in through search and through social media and other places, other places, you know, it, it's a much tighter paywall. There were, remember the Times first paywall experiment, Times Select, where they actually yeah. thought, you know, you couldn't live without Tom Friedman and Maureen Dowd, <laughs> so here's 50 bucks a year. Uh, and that did, you know, they ended up shutting that down and going, the one thing that's gone away largely is that quote unquote hard paywall. Um, um, so they might think, well, yeah, you might go to the Dallas Morning News a few times, and you know what, if you go six or seven times a month, you're fine, and if you go more than that, then you know I mean, you, can't you should be living in Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that is a good know, question. You can't go to Dallas. You can't go to St. Louis. You can't. Go. There are a lot of places you can't go. Yeah. You're right. There, there was a big debate about it, and I, it went away, and I'm not quite sure why. Yeah, Jan, if we can get back to McLuhan. Uh, I've watched some YouTube videos today to think about what we would talk about tonight. And he ha it happened to be one that he was on the Today Show in the aftermath of the Carter Ford debate. And he was vehement about what a lousy job they both did because nobody understands the medium of television. Of course, that was his thing way back then. But one thing I thought was fabulous about what he said with what's going on now is as the global village, you know how we talked about that concept too? The global village, television will make us all one village. But villages have tribes within them. And tribalization is what's occurring here in our media with media fragmentation. That if I only watch my station, my news, my truth, and the other person watches their station, their news, their truth, no wonder we as a country cannot agree on just about anything. And it's frightening the heck out of me. Media fragmentation, a concept called narrow casting. I can avoid anything about that doctor in Philadelphia. I choose not to hear about that. And if I choose not to hear about it, it's not true then, in my mind. So I think, I think McLuhan would say, we're in worse shape now than we were in the 60s when he was talking about television. And are we still in the electronic age? Is the electronic age the same thing as the digital age? I don't know, I think it's more of the same. But we seem to be becoming more isolated, more tribalized than we were in previous decades or previous eras. I, I, I think that's a very important point. Yeah. It raises a question for Mark, because you described that the, the largest of the cable um, attractors is um, uh, Bill um, O'Reilly, yeah. who gets a grand total of three and a half million, you said? Maybe three on a good night. And uh, as, as a percentage of the market, as a percentage of all of the people seeking news, do we have any sense mm -hmm. For how many of them are seeking their own news to reinforce their own biases, mm -hmm. and how many actually are curious to know what's going on? Because those people, from your description, should have enough options to be able to put together the mosaic and, and, and figure out some shape of the truth. It's a great so, question. Yeah. Can I address that? Yeah. It's not necessarily intentional. Mm -hmm. um, right. What's happening right now with data right. protection is that you can go to a site and the headline may change for you and you don't know why it happens, you don't recognize that it happens. So you don't even necessarily have to choose that I only want to look at things that fit mm -hmm. my profile. A lot of sites are already doing it for you. Right, so, there's, so there right. is that, and it's, it's very real. Uh, but how many people actually would be seeking uh, uh, to reinforce their biases? How many are seeking to have some sense of a, of a broader? Well, what she described very aptly then so is the journalism, what we call the journalism of validation. And obviously, it's you know, it's a it's a it's an easy trap to fall into. You know, in an election season, you know, if you're a liberal, Rachel Maddow and Huffington Post, then you're happy as a clam. You know, and if you're if you're if you're a conservative, then it's Fox and Drudge, and you're happy as a clam, and never the twain shall meet. 
we don't have I w we don't have data or any good data on what percentage of people and frankly we don't think people would tell the truth. One we have asked over time do you want do you prefer to have your journalism objective and straight and facts? And then yes, shockingly, a large majority of the respondents say they would. But we never we have not yet gotten to the point where we actually what we need to do is sort of you know, put something on, some, give them some device where we actually see what they do. I think well, we can come to a conclusive result here. Ask Dr. Scheinman what stations he listens to. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that uh, what uh, I read about uh, uh, what uh, McLuhan had to say about the, the time of appeasement that the people who didn't want to hear about Hitler because the anti red was there badge of courage. We have that now, so we have, it, it is worse because there's just more of it. There are more people uh, reading and thinking and blogging uh, about what every subject. So it seems we're even more um, divided and ever the silos increase. There, there are lots of silos in which one can live. Uh, so I'm looking to education. <laughs> Uh, to offer us some kind of respite from this, that, that, that uh, people who uh, uh, learn to uh, discern what, not only what they want to hear that's comfortable, but you know, have some, some kind of, I don't, I don't even like the word objectivity, they, you know, it's, we know that nothing is absolutely objective, but some reliable sources. I hope that, that some people who graduate from here uh, will know that there are some sources that they can rely on. Well, isn't part of, I think, what we've discovered here is that we need a kind of personal methodology, and that's what I think at Maureen Dowd, who's not herself, she's a siloed op-ed writer, yeah. you know, <laughs> she's not an objective reporter yeah, per se, but, but she talks about that, and she says we have to invent a new personal methodology, and I think that you know, that exercise of us going around, if we all read all of the different sources that we, you know, and I think to the point that someone was talking about earlier about, about Facebook, Facebook is certainly not the only thing you'd want to look at, but you, but if you have <coughs> many different friends of many different political persuasions and many, and from around the world, you do get, and, they, and it can be done in different ways, to, and subscribe to different, like yeah, like other different, publications. Uh, other publications, you can get that. You, but it's a lot of time to spend. And that's yeah, if you don't. Don't all day, every day, you didn't have a job yeah. and babies and all right, that right. stuff. Right, right. So how do we advise in terms of the education side? How do we help people sift through that? What, what is the... Well, I think you know, talking about it in classes, I teach the senior seminar in the communication department. And one of our, the theme of that seminar this semester is civic engagement and trying to get students to see how the political process works. And in fact, Sandra comes in talks about that in my class. A book that I've been using for the past three years in that seminar is a book by a journalist, a name of True Enough, of Harad Manju. Are you familiar with him? Mm -hmm. He's a fellow who is a journalist, a young guy, and he wrote this book talking about this idea of media fragmentation and how we, we self-select our media, and it's a really mm -hmm. interesting read for my students who are oftentimes divided upon between the Foxes and the uh, MSNBCs, and it says like, wow, you didn't realize that. <coughs> it also talks about agenda setting theory, cognitive dissonance theory, selective perception, and some theory, but it's a palatable book, so I, I suggest it. You can buy it on Amazon, true enough. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I, I didn't mean to, to suggest earlier that the leader, uh, the preacher, is particularly at full, uh, he or she is just half of the equation. That, that congregation out there has to be willing to, 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 to ask of a pastor, don't tell us what we want to hear, tell us what we need to hear. And that takes a lot of maturity, a lot of strength. The great prophets all said, the truth of God is offensive. The very truth is offensive. So, so it, 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 you know, it, it, it calls on us, too, who, who watch, read, uh, listen, uh, to, to, to be poised to, to, to go after it. 
uh, that being the truth. Okay, we have five more minutes. So, um, Gloria. I would like to say that it is true. We do watch what we want to hear, certainly I do. On the other hand, we are bombarded by information today in a way that we never were before. It's hard to avoid even if you don't want to hear. So even though you may be watching one point of view, there are so many avenues that come to you. Um, you in every, obviously, Facebook, Twitter, uh, the news, we were never bombarded by the kind of news that we are today and by the amount of information that's out there. And yes, it's difficult to sift through it and know what's right and wrong. That's true in everything, but I don't think that we can really isolate ourselves today in a way that we're not exposed to various sides. If I can just ask Mark maybe a question to respond to that. Uh, John Stewart only came up, I think, with one person. Yeah. And some of this, this over-saturation, I think, can lead to apathy. Like, you just get overwhelmed. And so now we have more and more young people who will really go to Stephen Colbert and John Stewart as their, as their mm -hmm. media, you know, as their, and he reports, and there's a lot of daily news that's obviously, you know, no pun intended. Well, he so what do you report on things he does. that nobody else sure. does? Well, the, other, the thing about, the <laughs> yeah. thing about so Stewart is you actually funny. have to know what's going on to yeah. appreciate yeah. it. Oh, yeah. yeah. Right. That's true. Yeah. Um, and he, you know, I've interviewed him, He's, he chafes at the idea that, you know, when, when he hears surveys that more people under the age of 21 can serve their favorite news source than anybody else, he chafes, I'm not a journalist, I'm a comedian, but that's, you know what, I mean, he, he does, again, and you know, yes, it's in a humorous context, but he does fact check. I mean, he does a, a tradition, what he does on some level is not all that different from what Tim Russert used to do on Meet the Press, which is he'd have somebody on and then he'd bring up a, something that the guy said, there'd be a little Chiron, you know, two years ago that completely contradicted him. And in sort of another, you know, medium and another style, Stewart does a lot of that. And you do have to know what's going on to be, to appreciate it, no doubt. I, I think there's a generation gap in, in how we use the media and what, we, what sources we use. My contemporaries are not using Facebook and they're not Twittering and maybe don't even want to. Many of them don't even have computers. So this perhaps is leading to different, what will I say, understanding of what's going on in the world. I mean, we're, uh, I would say rely, relying on the newspapers and the television as opposed to going to Facebook and Twitter. I, I am not aware of what the differences would be because I don't go to Facebook and I don't go to Twitter. But this could be a... Yeah. Bill. Online. Bill. Oh, go Bill. ahead, Bill. Bill. Oh, my worry is that the young people don't go to the news media at all. I mean, yeah. not yeah. at all. Yeah, they rely on them. Yeah. Yeah. You know, they rather, you know, yeah. they might go to Facebook or, or Twitter and that's about it in terms of where they're getting their news from. I mean. At least in terms of my perception, maybe I'm wrong. And yet, there are some of them who don't seem to go to any news source are very informed. I've noticed. I know a lot of young mm -hmm. people, and yeah. I don't understand this phenomenon. That's <laughs> <laughs> it. Yeah. Yeah. We haven't discussed that. I think my mother was talking about that a little. I have been appalled by the failure of younger people to vote. Mm -hmm. I mean, um, my generation, it's just, you just, it's one of your civic duties and obligations and pleasures to vote. But I have, so, I know so many young, younger people couldn't care less. I, I just don't understand that. You know, I think people think all politicians are alike. The younger people, definitely. And that's not true. They have to can make a difference, one vote, and they don't bother to vote. Yeah. Okay. Couple, um, can I, well, number one is there's, there's actually people out there that want them to think that way and have planted yeah. those ideas that there is no difference. Norm Ornstein, you know, and Tom Mann wrote considerably on that and were almost isolated. They didn't get anywhere near the press uh, or, uh, on those things. But I want to get back to like, the civics. Uh, you know, we're here at a university, and there used to be the idea of a quote unquote liberal education where you had a broad base and you got information and whatever. And now you go to uh, universities, and you know they're 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 you know science you know you go to the science 
and they cut out a lot of the, the liberal arts. You go business yeah. schools. Uh, last year, about this time, Tom Friedman spoke down in Wilkes-Barre, and I and I asked them, and I said, you know, uh, Bill Gates did not have a business education. Uh, not Bill Gates. Uh, uh, what's Steve, Jobs. Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs. Did not have a business education. Uh, what should these people yeah. be studying besides business? And he mentioned civics is one of the things. Well, Just friends, okay. um, I let Mark close this off because there is a group outside who apparently are going to be using this <laughs> 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 here. Uh, and since you are visiting. Um, Guru, well, you want to give us the last word and I, then we'll take off? A really interesting discussion. Uh, uh, it's great that everybody showed up. Um, <laughs> and, you know, if, if I were to give you one piece of advice, it, it would be to, you know, to, to digest some news from the other side, from time to time. From the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.